Ken Adams' view of realism was to suspend the audience's disbelief by having a set which has all the information you want in it, but you heighten certain aspects of the set to emphasize what you want to do from the point of view of the drama. And they tell you things about the characters. So in James Bond, you know, before the baddie even comes in, you see his lair and you know an awful lot about his personality. This is a megalomaniac who lives in a Führer bunker. You know, and uh, so this guy's got serious psychological problems. Everything's much, much larger than life. And you know that before the guy even opens his mouth. We think the basement of the Pentagon is a war room with a shiny black floor. There isn't one, but there is. In all our minds, we've accepted that as the reality. For Ken, that's what a production designer does. Ken Adam was most famous for these big sets of a sort of heightened reality, a kind of stylized reality. But there's this other side of Ken, however, which hasn't been emphasized so much, which I think leads towards Barry Lyndon, which is he had designed a lot of historical films. In fact, the first serious film that he was involved in was The Queen of Spades, 1947, with Oliver Messel, the great designer and had just designed, before Barry Lyndon, a film called Sleuth, which was set in a huge country house in Dorset called Athelhampton, which he found. And then in the studio, built this strange interior full of automata and games and strange perspectives and so on. Stanley Kubrick and Ken Adam worked very, very closely together on Dr. Strangelove. Kubrick had been very impressed by Dr. No and contacted Ken and said, I think you're just the man to visualize two sets, the war room underneath the Pentagon and the B-52 bomber. And so they got very, very close. However, Ken was shredded by the experience, he said. that There was something about the relentless logic of Kubrick where everything had to be justified. You know, why is the war room that shape? Why is it triangular? Why is it made of concrete? Why have we got to shine? Why, why, why? And Ken said, hang on, hang on, slow down. You know, it looks great and let, let's stay with it. And in fact, when Stanley Kubrick starts working on his new movie, Journey Beyond the Stars, which was the first title of what became 2001, A Space Odyssey, and he gets in touch with Ken and says, I'd really, I'd really like you to be my production designer on it. And I interviewed Ken about what went through his mind. He said, look, the plus was, the war room was the best design I ever did. Kubrick is fantastically talented, but interpersonally, it was a shredding experience emotionally. Did I want to go through it again, particularly on a movie where he had all these people from NASA advising him on the hardware and the vehicles and the space science. And they would always know more than Ken did. So whenever Ken came up with a design, they'd say, well, NASA doesn't approve that. He said, I really don't think I could exercise my imagination at all in that situation. So he decided never again, never again, never again until the autumn of 1972 when Stanley Kubrick tracks him down and says, I would like you to be my production designer on Barry Lyndon. And uh, he says, I can't pay you the full rate, I'm afraid, Ken. I can offer you about half what you normally get for a film. Now, the production designer's role was absolutely key to keep in mind the whole visual experience of the movie. There's the design progression of the movie. You've got to think about that. So Ireland, Seven Years' War, Baroque Europe, English country house. You've got to think about how do the costumes and all the props relate to the interiors. Then there's the links between the interiors and the exteriors, which visually is very important. Then there's the, the overall visual concept of each scene. So Ken writes back and says, oh, it's quite simple, I won't do it then. Six weeks later, Kubrick rewrites to him and says, all right, I'll give you your usual fee as a production designer. Come and join me on Barry Lyndon. And Ken said, I thought about it very, very hard. All right, why not? So he takes the plunge, and on the 1st of January, uh, he starts work on Barry Lyndon. But Barry Lyndon was completely different because it was to be entirely on location. In fact, between the 1st of January 1973, when he started working on it, through till the summer of 1973, he sat with Stanley Kubrick arguing about whether they could use studios as well as locations. Stanley started with the idea, apparently, let's do this film entirely on location. Let's use authentic historical locations to give ourselves a, a window into the 18th century. 
And I want to know how people lived in these locations, how they walked around, what the background was. You can say, yeah, but that's all very well. It's expensive, probably. Kubrick said, no, no, it's much, much cheaper to work on, on location, much, much cheaper. Um, and of course, what Ken spotted is that in studios, you have control. You order a set, the carpenters build it, that's it. You can't change your mind. So right from the very beginning, there was a kind of contradiction in his involvement in it. But eventually, by the summer of 73, they agree it is going to be entirely on location. And the reason was the circumstances in which the film was made. Ken starts work on the 1st of January, 1973. And the first concept was to shoot the movie within a 30-mile radius of where Kubrick lived at that time. And that lasted for nearly six months, that idea. So every night, uh, Ken and Kubrick would sit at home watching slides of all these houses, but also slides of hundreds of paintings. Gainsborough portraits, Reynolds portraits, Hogarth for social life. Stanley said, by looking at these paintings, we know what the past looked like. But Ken says they were expressing themselves, and painters use imagination. Stanley, it didn't really look like that. So that was a bit of a, a clash. But anyway, all they're doing is discussing which are the most appropriate images. But then quite suddenly they decide, no, we'll shoot in Ireland. And this is, you know, like a month before they start shooting. And then everything was against the clock. Ken Adam did manage to find some remarkable historic houses, actually, in Ireland. Huntingdon Lodge, which partly doubles as Cousin Nora's dwelling. But the windows were wrong. So they got the craftsman at Pinewood to make historic Georgian windows and put them in Huntington for the purposes of the exterior. The cottage at the beginning, which everyone thinks is, you know, the perfect Irish cottage, was actually built by Ken Adam. I mean, it was a shell, and he decided to thatch it, create an aura of realism by all these bits and bobs that are added to make it look like the most realistic Irish cottage you've ever seen. However, Stanley Kubrick's method with Ken Adams seems to have been to, as it had been on Strange Love, to push and push and push until you reach bedrock. Why? Explain that to me logically. Justify it to me. Is that Georgian? Testing all the time, you know. Ken knew what he was getting into. He'd been through this under a Strange Love. This is a little bit more complicated. And then when you get to candle-lit interiors, I mean, how Ken stood it, I don't know, but you know, okay, you, you've agreed to do candles. So you need infill light as well as the light in shot. For every take, you have to renew every single candle so that it matches. That's the first thing. So you've got boxes and boxes and boxes of candles for each take. Then you're in a historic house and Ken has promised that absolutely no damage will be done to the floor, to the paintings, to anything. We, we'll be very careful and then the candles start dripping. So Ken has to design special drip collectors uh, around the infill ones so that they don't drip on the floor. And Ken would say, if we were in a bloody studio, none of this would happen. I could be in complete control. I can control the lighting, I can control the set. I don't have to worry about the stately home, you know. It must have been a very, very tense shoot. Then they have a nine week break where they rejig the entire story, cut all the scenes that are extraneous. So when the production shut down, they're in this house working out the second two-thirds of the shooting schedule in England. And Ken's wife, Letizia, goes over and sees Ken and realises there's something quite seriously wrong with him, that he's very nervy, not sleeping, and taking all these responsibilities on his own shoulders. And to cut a long story short, he has a massive nervous breakdown. And Ken said he had to relive everything he'd done in his professional life to get his confidence back. That what had happened was he'd completely lost his confidence in his own ability to make decisions. It was quite a long piece of therapy. And meanwhile, the schedules all worked out. The permissions had been granted. The whole of the second half of the movie has been mapped out. Now, the final decision, obviously, is left with the director. But Ken basically chose the component parts of Castle Hackton, of Lady Linden's house, which are quite extraordinary. First of all, you've got the exterior shot of Castle Howard in Yorkshire. That's the one across the lake. Then you go into the garden, which is a bit of Stourhead, a bit of Longleat, a bit of Wilton. Then you go inside, and each room 
comes from either a different room in a stately home or a different stately home. You've got Corsham Court, you've got Longleat, you've got Wilton, you've got all sorts of country houses around Salisbury. I found nine different country houses were used for the interior of Lady Linton's house. It's a kind of creative geography that's quite extraordinary. But Ken is not there when they're shooting a lot of it. Towards the end of the shooting schedule, Stanley Kubrick showed a rough cut of the story so far to senior executives at Warner Brothers. And he wrote a letter to Ken uh, congratulating him on the reaction of those executives. The executives had said they'd never seen a more beautiful film. They'd never seen a film where the production designer's role was so important. Meanwhile, Stanley Kubrick kept getting in touch with him and made a point of saying to Ken on various occasions, I am implementing everything visually that you suggested we do because he wanted Ken to be reassured that although he'd stepped away from the production, it wasn't some sort of runaway thing that we're going to forget about all his ideas. It had been worthwhile. All that blood, sweat, toil and tears had been worthwhile because actually it had set the template for the rest of the shoot. And then, of course, Ken gets the Oscar. He said it was doubly ironic that he should have got the Academy Award for Barry Lyndon. Ironic because he'd been doing dutifully doing all these drawings since 1947 and uh, uh, designing all these sets, and he didn't do a single drawing for Barry Lyndon to speak of. The other irony is that he got a second Academy Award for The Madness of King George. <laughs> well, actually, in fairness, The Madness of King George is a combination of sets and locations where he dressed up the locations quite a lot and, and did studio work as well as, quite radically, set dressing. So there was more artificiality but anyway, Ken loved the movie. He said, look, there's no gain saying. It is a kind of masterpiece, and it's one of the most beautiful films ever made. The trouble is, he said, whenever I look at it, it brings back an awful lot of not very good memories. I once asked Ken Adam about, you know, how did he get on with Stanley Kubrick after all this? And Ken said, if anything, we got closer than ever. And in fact, a couple of years later, Ken was working on The Spy Who Loved Me, the Bond film, and he was having real difficulty lighting one of the sets. There are three nuclear submarines inside this super tanker. So he gets in touch with Stanley Kubrick and says, Stanley, I've got to ask something really big of you. Would you come to Pinewood and help me light this set of The Spy Who Loved Me? I can't do that. Come on. Supposing I have a scene, you know, come on. You know, you know better than that, Ken. No, we'll go on a Sunday. You can wear dark glasses. We'll go to Pinewood. So they went to Pinewood together and spent several hours walking around the set and working out which lights would be justified in set and which would be outside the set. Stanley Kubrick helped to light the interior of the super tanker in The Spy Who Loved Me, which is nice. They buried the hatchet, they got on very well. They, they loved each other. But like, as Ken said, like most marriages, there's a love-hate element. Sometimes you love each other, sometimes you get at each other, and sometimes you go too far. It was like one of those marriages, and I think it remained so till the day both of them died.